Okay, let's continue our discussion with section three and uh, forming manufacturing processes. Um, and we will look at cold forming um, and specifically cold forming operations for metals. Uh, so in the last chapter, chapter 10, we looked at hot forming. And now we're going to look at the uh, other side of the coin, so to speak. Um, and that is to say, uh, this, these are forming operations that are done at uh, more or less room temperature, okay? Um, they can be a little bit elevated from room temperature, but generally we're talking about room temperature for cold forming operations, especially for sheet metal, things like that, okay? Um, so this is definitely below the recrystallization temperatures, obviously, because those are rather elevated, um, even though they're not into the liquid uh, making the metal a liquid uh, state, so so they are below that. But cold forming is typically done at room temperature. All right. Now there is such a thing as warm forming, okay, um, and that's done above room temperature, but still below recrystallization temperature. Okay. So um, really, just to reinforce things, recrystallization temperature is the main concept here in terms of the dividing line between hot forming that is forming operations done on hot metal and cold forming or forming operations done on cold metal all right uh, so what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of cold forming all right so first of all the advantages of cold forming um, there's no energy used to heat the metal so you can imagine remember some of the temperatures with hot forming were up in the 900 1000 even you know higher than a thousand degrees Fahrenheit that takes a lot of energy to bring a large because we're talking about large pieces of metal typically um, that takes a lot of energy to bring up um, bring metals up to that temperature okay um, and so if you take that out of the equation now your energy usage is going to go way down all right we can have closer tolerances being held why is that well because we don't have the expansion and contraction the shrinking that we inevitably get when a metal cools down from a elevated above re recrystallization to room temperature okay so metals shrink when they cool down and in fact just a little aside the only substance um, known to man that expands as it changes state from a liquid to a solid is uh, is water right so metal is going to shrink when it cools down uh, if you're not heating it up then you don't have any of that shrinkage so closer tolerances can be held with cold forming um, you also get a higher quality surface finish. You don't get oxidation. Remember the rust that, that is such a um, uh, terrible thing and hot forming that you need to, you know, actively try to uh, prevent it or remove it. Um, and you also increase the material strength and hardness with cold forming. Now, there is a drawback to that. We're going to talk about that in the, on the next side of this, the disadvantages. But we um, metals get stronger and harder with cold forming. Now, the disadvantages to that, right, is we get what's called work hardening, right? So when we do cold forming, we work harden the metal. And what happens with that is we reduce ductility. So we get a stronger metal, but it's less able to um, be ductile or to bend. You know, it basically is going to be very strong until it shatters. Okay. Um, also, some other disadvantages include you need more force required to shape the part, to form the part, right? Because we're not forming it when the metal is hot in a more plastic state. Stronger equipment, therefore, is required. Um, metal surfaces still need to be clean. Okay, we're not talking about forming rust or oxidation, but um, a, a, uh, through the cold forming operation, you know, with, with the higher forces required, surfaces that are unclean, that are dirty, you know, you're just going to make it worse. Um, and as I say, cold metals become less ductile. Uh, and the grain structure is distorted or fragmented, right? So we don't get that. Remember in the, in, with hot forming, when we get the recrystallization where the grains, uh, form, 
uh, a reform into more equiac structures that is equal, uh, more or less equal in all dimensions, and we get um, the uh, removal of impurities and porosities and all that stuff. So we're not getting that with with cold forming. Okay. Um, so the net result on all this, when you take the advantages and disadvantages, uh, cold forming is best suited to high volume production. Okay, not not low volume production. All right. <clears throat> Let's look at some of the cold forming techniques now, um, and we're going to look at bending, drawing, and squeezing. Okay, uh, so for a bending operation, this is a sheet metal operation. Um, it's very, very common, right? At bending sheet metal, that's what we're talking about, okay? That is a cold forming uh, technique, right? Because we don't elevate the temperature of the sheet metal before we do it, um, and we bend the metal past its... Uh, elastic state into its plastic state. Um, when you look around, many, 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 many products have at least one uh, sheet metal part in them. It's very common uh, that you'll see sheet metal in your car, at home, you know, wherever you're looking, you're going to find sheet metal. Computers, computer uh, uh, structures, you know, the, 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 uh, the case is made of sheet metal. Typically, with the plastic on the outside, a lot of the componentry um, is has sheet metal boxes uh, created. The advantages for sheet metal bending are uh, it's very inexpensive. It's a rapid operation. It can be painted and textured. And it's also not a very technical operation. That is to say, you know, you, you do need special equipment, but you don't need the extravagant, wild, specially trained on uh, equipment. So it's still accessible. You know, you and I could do it, right? Given something to bend the sheet metal on and some way to, to bend it, all right? The challenges with sheet metal... Uh, bending is how to how to um, accurately create double curve shapes and we'll look at that what a double curve shape is and then you also get limited shapes right we're still talking about taking a flat object right a a sheet of, a, a sheet of metal and bending it it's difficult to get more complex shapes in that right you're limited in how you can bend it looking more specifically at about what's going on with a bending operation um, we're plastically deforming a material beyond its yield strength, right? So the yield strength is that little peak in this stress strain curve uh, that separates the elastic region from the plastic region. So we definitely have to go beyond the yield strength into the plastic region so that the object doesn't come back to, you know, when we bend it and it stays. Now, there is a, a what's called a spring back, right? When we bend a piece of sheet metal, there's going to be some spring back where it comes back a little bit from the original bent shape. Uh, but that typically is accounted for. So what happens is you bend past that so that when the spring back occurs, you get the shape that you want to get. Um, in a, and we can see in this figure right here, the, the top is the piece of sheet metal. Um, and I, I want to draw your attention to the dotted line through the middle. That's what we would call our neutral axis. And that's basically the point at which the, the forces balance between compression and extension. So when we bend a piece of sheet metal here, right, um, on the inside of this piece of sheet metal, we have compression, right? All the, 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 the inside surfaces are being kind of scrunched together. They're being jammed together. While on the outside, the shape out here, the surfaces out here are being expanded. So there's expansion, uh, stretching on the outside, right? So we have on the inside compression, on the outside expansion, and if, and they're going to zero out at some point. So there's a balance. So when you go a little bit inside the metal, you're going to get a little bit less compression. When you go from the outside, when you go a little bit in, you're going to be getting a little bit more extension um, until you get zero compression and zero expansion. And that's where the neutral axis is. It's not quite halfway through the material. It's about 60% through the material. And you can kind of see that the way they've shown this in this diagram. Okay. 
Um, we're not going to get too much into detail about uh, about sheet metal, um, probably not more than what we're looking at here. Uh, we do cover it a lot in our detailing class, MDT 110. So we actually go through the calculations and, and draw uh, sheet metal parts. Some examples of sheet metal parts you can see here it looks like a bracket thingy. Um, this looks like the inside of a door for a car. Um, here we have a now this this looks like it might be a um, uh, an oil reservoir for a car um, or some kind of sink. And what's amazing is that this is from a flat sheet. This starts out as a flat sheet, as does this. Now this is bent up probably from several flat sheets because there's no way we can make um, a shape like this from one part. And you can almost see that we have one flat sheet here that's bent up on the back side here and the front side here and then another sheet that is bent up on the inside kind of in opposite directions. So let's talk a little bit about plasticity, dislocations, and work hardening. Right? We've already mentioned the term work hardening, um, but plasticity and dislocations um, are things that occur during a bending operation. Okay, so first of all, let's get a couple of defin definitions uh, out of the way here. Stress, remember the stress strain curve. So we're talking about the stress part of the stress strain curve, which is the Y axis. Stress is the compressive or tensile force per unit area or pressure. So compressive or tensile force just means that it's the force that we're compressing the material or tensile means pulling it apart, okay? Um, and it's a pressure, so it's force divided by area. The strain is the amount of deformation, right? How much it's stretching. So when we look at the stress strain curve, right? Remember that at the beginning of the stress strain curve, on the left-hand side, we have the, um, the elastic region, right? And, and this, this line, notice that this line is straight right there. And that represents the region uh, from which if we're bending a metal, in this region. Now, what when I say bending a metal in this region, what do I mean? Well, what I mean is we're not applying a force greater than sigma y, right? That's stress sub y. That's the yield stress, okay? Or yield strength, same, same thing, okay? So as long as we do not apply a force greater than that force right there, when we release the metal, that we just bend, it will go back to its original shape. Once we bend a metal past the yield strength right here, then we get into the plastic region. And basically what that means is when we bend a metal with a force greater than the yield strength, some of it is going to bend back a little bit, that's the spring back, but the, the shape is not gonna return to its original shape we're gonna have a bent piece of metal, okay? Um, and that's the, that's the main thing that, that you need to get out of this, okay? As, especially with cold forming, all right? Um, the area under the curve here, or the area, I, I should say, the area to the right of the yield strength in this region here is the plastic area, okay? And the area to the left is the elastic area, okay? Um, so there's four basic sheet metal properties that we're looking for. We want to know the Young's modulus, which is the ratio, basically it's the slope of this straight line. That's called the Young's modulus. The yield stress, which is sigma y, also known as the yield strength. The tensile stress, sigma ts, which is the peak here, right? When you go beyond the tensile stress, the tensile strength or tensile stress region right here, when we go above this force, then the part is going to, or the metal is going to tear or break. It's already started the tear or break. And then strain to failure is just the end. That's where the, the, the part, the metal completely separates into two or more parts. Okay. So those are the four main features here. So, um, as I mentioned, elastic region here, plastic region uh, to the right of that, the yield stress or yield point, the ultimate stress is the peak, and then the failure point is the end. 
Structural design obviously must always be yes, less than yield strength. What is structural design? Structures, right? You don't want to be in a building where um, the forces are have have uh, been greater than the yield stress because that means your building is bending. Or a car, you don't want to be in a car where the the force is going to be greater than that. You know, because then things aren't coming back; they're going to stay bent. If you've ever been in an accident, right? And hopefully you haven't, but if you've ever been in an accident and um, the the force of impact is greater than the yield stress, how do you know? Well, let's say your chassis bends or the metal door uh, or metal panel bends, all right? That means essentially that we have gone past the yield stress um, in force. All right, so sheet metal forming is obviously done above the yield point, right? It wouldn't be any, <laughs> it you wouldn't be making anything if you never go past the yield stress because you'd bend it and it'd come back, right? So <laughs> think about it. So uh, we have to go beyond this point in order to bend things and make them stay. So that's what we, to get plastic strain, you have to go above the yield stress. Elastic strain material deforms under loading and returns to its original shape. That's not what we want. Plastic strain, that's what we want. Okay, so um, so during the, the sheet metal bending operation, the strength of the material is going to rise as it deforms past the yield point. So this is actually an interesting thing. As we bend the metal, it's going to get stronger and start to resist that bending. Right, so it's kind of fighting against us. Strain hardening, also known as, known as work hardening or cold working, is the strengthening of a metal by plastic deformation. Now, um, I think I might have mentioned this example before, but if you take a, um, let's say a paper clip and you bend it over and over again, you know, you open it up and then you bend it, flex it over and over again, you're actually doing strain hardening or work hardening or cold working it. Okay, so you're actually going to heat up the metal there. You can feel it when, when you do that. You're going to heat up the metal locally right at that bend. And that bent area there is going to get much stronger, but it's also going to be less ductile. So, you know, continuing to bend it is going to cause it to fracture. Um, as I said, after plastic deformation, there's going to be a slight spring back. And you can actually see the spring back here. This is... Notice that the Young's modulus curve right there, or the straight line right there, um, where we have fully elastic deformation. When we go past it and we um, bend it with a force greater than the yield stress, we, we let's say we just get up to here, um, and then we release it. Notice the spring back can be found by taking the slope of this line, this, the Young's modulus, and applying it at the point where we stop applying the load and then go backwards. And that's how much spring back in and measured in strain, right? So we can calculate the spring back. <clears throat> All right, um, some other things that, uh, that are worthy of noting, the minimum uh, bending radius kind of uh, defines how much the material can be bent without causing material failure. Um, and we can see in here the neutral axis for this, and we can calculate where the neutral axis is. Material is pushed out here, material is drawn in on the outside of the curve. And then we have a strain distribution. Remember, compression on the inside, uh, tension on the outside. Uh, so this is just getting into more detail. Um, this is not covered in your book. So this is just some, some areas that I thought that it would be, uh, interesting, noteworthy to include on that. Um, of course, materials behave differently during tactile testing than during bending. Okay. So, um, and that's something that's important. You know, if you're ever going to bend a piece of metal, you, you really have to do the experimentation with that metal under that circumstances under those circumstances to get a true reaction of how the metal is going to uh, uh, respond to that. All right, strain to failure underestimates what the material can do in terms of bending, All right? So that's a couple of things of note. 
Um, spring back, spring back is defined as the change in the shape of the bent part when the load is removed, when you release it, when you let go. Okay. Um, if the amount of spring back can be predicted, which it can for, for m most parts very accurately, then the material can be bent slightly more than necessary so that it springs back to the desired shape. And that's what I said, you know, you, you bend it a little bit past where you want it to go. So the spring back takes it to where you want it to be. So for example, if we need a 90 degree bend, but know that the material has a 5% spring back, we could bend it 95% to get it to the final 90 after the spring back. And that's what sheet metal bending does. All right. So um, this is just another uh, little example um, trying to uh, explain spring back a little bit. The amount of spring back is difficult to predict, right? Because it's very dependent on the environment the metal, the exact dimensions of the metal, how the bending occurs. So it's very specific, okay? Um, but we can get reasonably good approximations. And of course you can do experimentation. So, so if you were going to go in production with sheet metal operation, you, you would uh, bend the metal that you, that you want to bend where you want to bend it. And then you would measure the amount of spring back and then that would become your template for going further. All right. Um, so as I said, spring back is a function of material type, sheet thickness, bend radius, bend angle, temperature, all, you know, if it's a hot day versus a cold day, uh, you know, and you're working in a shop, that, that all is going to be a factor. It, um, even such things as how quickly you bend it, right? All right. And here, this, this is called, remember, this is the spring back area right here, and this is called the elastic recovery. All right, so let's look at some single curved um, uh, cold forming or bending operations, right? We have bending, roll bending, and roll forming. Now, uh, again, uh, allow me to repeat myself. Go watch the videos, okay? I have a lot of videos in this. Um, you might think that you are familiar with sheet metal bending or, or sheet metal operation, but trust me, I have some really cool videos. Um, one uh, video or at least a couple videos I have in there are of automated sheet metal um, uh, machines. And uh, I visited these machines. There's, there's one up in Hoffman Estates, um, a company called Trumpf, T-R-U-M-P-F. It's a German company. Um, and they have automated sheet metal uh, bending machines, and it's really some amazing stuff. They're robotic, and, and it's really fantastic. This is a sheet metal operation. This is a roll forming operation. You might recognize these as like for roofing, okay? Um, here we have the different dies that are used to create the bend. All right, and so... Uh, in this example, we have the upper tool and the V die, and the bending is going to happen in the in this front V die area. Sheet metal thickness in in this type of operation can range from six thousandths of an inch to a quarter inch, which is pretty thick. Quarter inch, you know, that's a some major tooling that's required for that. Um, we can actually do um, in some operations more than a quarter inch. All right. Um, and there's different types of bending machines we have, and there's a lot of different names for these. So it's, it's kind of tough to, to look at this because it's like everybody has their own name for things. And there's a lot of variation here, but bar folder, box and pan break, cornice break, press break, punch press, maybe different com uh, countries even have different names for it. So here's some examples of this. This, uh, is a, um, this would be a air bending operation, right? Because we're bending and notice that we have these little set offs right there. You can see that up in the top left hand corner, that little, see how that raised section right there and there, that's going to keep the metal off of this bottom surface. And we're using this upper die to kind of push it down and the sheet metal will bend around this radius, but it won't go into the bottom. Here we have a V die bending. This is kind of like in the last example right here, um, where the die, the upper die is going to fit nicely right in there. And then we have a more complicated bending operation down here. Okay. Roll bending is what we do when we want to make a big uh, hoop, 
okay, or a tank, right? So if you want to make a sheet metal tank, you're going to use a roll bending operation. Um, there's different types of uh, configurations. You can have two, three, or four rollers, right? You can have offsetting rollers. Notice the upper roller here and the bottom roller uh, are directly offset, and this one is out there in the, uh, you know, just hanging out. Then we can have the upper roll in a pyramid kind of situation where it's in between the two lower rollers. And then we can have this kind of a, a mix of both, right? And basically what's happening here, and again, I encourage you to watch the video uh, because I have videos of this. The, the roll is going to go back and forth and back and forth. And each time it's going to bend it a little bit more until you get a full circle. Roll forming operations. This is where we take a sheet and we progressively bend it until we get the de desired shape at the end. Okay. Um, these can be high speed operations. Right, very neat stuff. You can see the progressive dies that are used. Now, uh, on to double curve parts. So double curve parts are basically um, the the sheet metal bending operation where we're going to curve it in two or more directions. Okay, think of the body panel of a car. Right, um, body panels of a car are you know they're never just bent in one direction. They always have kind of a double multi dimensional bending. And that's what a double curved shape is. Now, double curved are actually kind of hard to do um, because you have a lot of things going on in different directions. So we can't just control spring back because it's not coming in one direction. All right. So they're very complicated and the machines are highly specialized for doing this. Um, don't worry. We're not going to get into any of this. This is just a little bit of a description just to help you understand. But this is not um, covered in the book. Right. Um, but for double curve parts, we uh, we have to control a lot of variables. Right. So we have elastic strain in the same direction. It can also be in different directions. And so there's there's competing things. Plus, um, with a bending operation, part of the shape is going to be, you know, this is a weird thing to say, but is going to be consumed in the operation. Um, if you've ever done sheet metal bending, you'll, you, you might remember or know that when you take a flat piece of sheet metal and bend it, it actually gets shorter, right? Um, so it's, it's some of the, some of the length of the metal is going to be consumed in the bending operation, right? How do you control that when you're bending in multiple directions? Well, it's it's a very complicated thing, right? And like I said, the good thing about it is we're not going to be calculating it. Um, so uh, these are some examples of double curve parts, okay? And a lot of them are structural because double curve parts are structurally strong for their for their weight. Their strength to weight ratio is very good, okay? Is very good. Um, one old method for doing uh, for creating double curve parts is using these panel beading techniques, or this is called an English wheel. Now, if you've ever watched the show um, with Jesse James, where he used to build motorcycles, custom motorcycles, um, I think there was, there was another show where they do custom motorcycles, but a lot of custom motorcycle metal work is done using this double curved English wheel or even beating the, um, the, the piece of metal this is like a, uh, a bag filled with sand or beans or something. Um, and, and so it's a highly, it's, it's very craftsman like, right? You can see a, this car body was created with um, all, it looks like entirely from double curve parts, uh, double curve shapes. Okay, moving on to deep drawing operations. This is a high volume production. It's used to make uh, well, as you can see, a lot of, a lot of kitchen stuff, um, cans, cooking parts, cooking pots, uh, trays, sinks, all that stuff. They're done with successive dies. So we're not going to do, we're not going to create the shape with one drawing operation. We have to do multiple drawing operations. Okay. So this is an example. We start with a press blank, blank, right? A flat sheet. Remember this all starts with flat sheets. And we punch in, the, the punch is going to draw down and it's going to press down 
and stretch this out while it's being held in the um, in, in the uh, the vice like retainer here until you have your finished shape. Okay, very neat operation. Go watch my videos. Um, and then finally, how do we? What are some other methods that we have for creating double curved sheet metal parts? Uh, well, we already talked about panel meeting, panel beating or hammering, deep drawing operation. These are double curve parts. These are all double curve parts. Um, match die forming. A lot of that is what we what you see with uh, panel um, car bodies, right? Uh, automated assembly lines creating stamping out car bodies are all going to have match dies. Um, sequential dies, right, where you have one set of dies and then another one that bends it a little bit more. Rubber forming, hydro forming. Um, I think I have some, I, I, I can't remember, I think I do have some videos in there with hydro forming. Hydro forming is really interesting because it uses water pressure to bend the metal. Um, and uh, you can, so if you, if you have a, uh, like a mountain bike or something like that and you and you notice that the tubes of the mountain bike are not cylindrical, right? So I have a mountain bike and the tubes are kind of teardrop shaped, you know, um, or they or they have uh, kind of a square, square top to them. And you're wondering how on earth do you create a, a tube with that kind of cross section? Well, interestingly enough, you hydroform it. And so what you do is you take the tube, right, that, the, that it's a cylinder to start with. It's a cylinder. And you put it in a die so that the, the die shape is what you want uh, to get out um, from, the, from the operation, the final tube shape, right? You seal both ends of the tube. You put it in the die. And then you put high-pressure water in there inside the tube. And when you push the high-pressure water in there and really pressurize it, the water is going to push out on the tube, the cylinder, and it's going to fit it into the die. So that's how you get those fancy mountain bike shapes. Um, and again, look at the videos because I'm pretty sure I have one in there. If I don't and you're really jonesing for that video, I will find it and, and put it in there. But I, I know I've used it before in class. All right. So that's it. That takes us through um, cold forming. The next Topics that we'll look at will be um, forming of plastics. All right, see you then.